Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Jay Dreamers and man, I love that video. So let's talk about space whales and the great beasts of old, the old world monsters, so to speak. Now, I just want to start this video by, by basically saying, um, this is not based on academia's teachings. This is not based on fact, uh, you know, as, as it's presented to us, this is based on my intuition and my research. So just keep that in mind for those of you who are new to my channel. Um, also bear with me cause I'm going to explain a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff and hopefully it'll make more sense as we go. All of this is directly related to the plasma apocalypse, the cyclical, uh, cataclysm that befalls our world from time to time. And, um, these old world monsters are one of the one of the cyclical events um, where they enter into our world for a time. So let's get right into it. First and foremost, um, I like to watch Star Trek. Jenny watches Star Trek. Uh, she's a huge Trekkie fan, and I love all of the all of the space movies. You know, even though I don't I don't really follow the concept of space as it's presented to us, I knew there was something more to it than just what met the eye, just like Transformers, right? Anyhow, these old world monsters, these space whales, as you saw in the video, whale is just another word for monster, okay? And a monster is just a, a real big, typically ugly thing or an it that we don't know what it is, you know? We, we're not familiar with it. It's so alien that it's monstrous, okay? Both in size and appearance. So I call these uh, beings the phantazoids uh, for many different reasons. The zoid part at the end basically just means uh, being or creature and phanta, um, which basically means dreamlike. They're dream creatures. These are creatures that only appear every once in a while and they leave an imprint upon our collective subconscious. They leave an imprint on our memories, on our myths and our legends, uh, and they never really go away, you know? And for those of you who are new to my channel, I'm a huge believer, and this is what I talk about, I'm a believer in the uh, finding the factual within the fantastic. I'm a, I'm a believer that they put the truth into sci-fi. They put it into fantasy. They put it into fiction. As a matter of fact, I personally find more truth 
in those different subjects than I do um, the official academics that we've been taught and in the quote unquote real world of today. So let's talk about this. First of all, I want to talk about Star Trek, right? I knew there was something off. I knew there was something more to Star Trek. And then I saw the episode that had the space whale. And the, when I first saw the space whale, I was like, whoa, like bells and whistles were going off my head. I'm like, what is that thing doing? That's just some flying creature out in the vacuum of space. But then they included the tardigrade. And the tardigrade, which sounds a lot like TARDIS, by the way, um, the tardigrade is a real being. It's an animal. It's, it's, it's uh, I believe it's known as the, the tiniest animal in the world that we've discovered so far. And, you know, it's kind of in our pop culture a little bit. You know, you might see cute little tardigrade images or t-shirts or things of that nature. However, when I saw the tardigrade and they and they said what it was because I didn't know what it was at first. I thought it was just a monster, you know, but it was so big that I didn't relate it to the microscopic animal that it is. Okay. Actually it's microscopic and macroscopic. And we're going to talk about that too. But when I saw the tardigrade, everything just like a light bulb went off in my mind. And I was like, they're not in space. They're traveling the macrocosm, you know, they are the microcosm that is in the, the macrocosm. Uh, micro means small macro means big. So yeah, that's a, that's, that's a creature that belongs in the microscopic world. That's where it comes from. That's how we know about it. It's microscopic. So what is the USS Enterprise doing, you know, with this huge gigantic tardigrade in there? Well, the only thing that the simplest answer for me is that, uh, they themselves are very, very tiny, or at least they have left the world where things are normal on earth. And when they're out there in the macrocosm, all of a sudden the enterprise is very small, which by the way, you'll see in the, uh, the images down here, you know, some of the clips of the new star Trek discovery, uh, TV show and in their introduction, which is totally different than all the other ones. They show the Enterprise as a tiny little speck flying through and there's like these huge plants like trying to get the Enterprise and they're showing gigantic human bodies and stuff. Meanwhile, the Enterprise is just going through. Just like for those of you who are a little bit older, you might remember uh, Fantastic Voyage, right? Fantastic Voyage. They go into the human body and, um, you know, any monsters that were there, they're just a natural part of that chemistry of the chemical makeup of the body. Right. And, but they're so small that they see them as obstacles. They see them as the monsters. So anyhow, phantazoids, I, I define this loosely as creatures that become something entirely different when entering into new fractal worlds. And I'm going to talk about the fractal verse uh, in just a bit towards the end, actually. But basically, um, let's take the tardigrade, for example, right? When you take it from the microcosm, it's relatively harmless. We don't even realize that they are everywhere. They outnumber the human population by a lot. Um, it's, it's nothing to be feared. It's nothing. No one really even knows they exist. You know, they're so small. They're so tiny They're They go unnoticed. However, when they cross over into the macrocosm and then re-enter into our world, now all of a sudden they are Godzilla or they are the T-Rex or they're, you know, they're all kinds of beasts of old and these ancient monsters. Um, you know, a lot of this is just some of us is speculation, like the dinosaurs and stuff like that, but you get the point. So monster literally translates into whale, which is very interesting for me. Also Leviathan and behemoth. Now being, um, a one time biblical scholar that I was, I was very intrigued with the concept of the Leviathan and the behemoth because these were animals that were described in such a way that they didn't match any known animals of today. You know, a lot of scholars, uh, cause I went to school with people that grew up and, you know, they studied these things, they became pastors and stuff. And we had, we had discussions and studies about the behemoth and the Leviathan, you know, and a lot of, there's basically two schools of thought. There is the, it, it's known animals just being described in an odd way, or it's not, they are alien animals which is what I lean towards. You know, these are the Leviathans. These are the behemoths. And, um, you know, I'm sure that they were called many, many other things, 
But these are real monsters. Monsters do exist. We just haven't seen one in a long time, you know? Every once in a while, they, may, they might rear their heads. However, the people who are in charge of our world at this current time uh, tend to cover those monsters up anytime that they're found. You know, and they're, they're found occasionally from time to time. They used to be found a lot more. You see the Enterprise down there? That looks like like skin. It's like going right over some skin. That whole thing. You got to check out the intro to uh, the new Star Trek Discovery. Anyhow, these are monsters. But it's really interesting to me that the word whale is also a synonym for monster. Just like in Pinocchio, Monstro, the whale, who is the bad guy in the, you know, in the, in the movie. Um, but here's the, here's another really interesting thing. These are the signs of this reoccurring cyclical plasma apocalypse that will happen and does happen all the time. You know, we're entering, we're going to be entering into a new world, uh, just like, uh, the local tribal people near where I live talk about, um, you know, there's the fourth world, the third world, the fifth world. There's all these new worlds because we go through these cyclical events, these cataclysms or these ap apocalypse. I like the word apocalypse because it means unveiling. It means like a surprise, something new, a new beginning. It, 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 it doesn't really carry the meaning. It's not supposed to carry the meaning, the end of all things, you know? No, nah, it's just, it's, it's just a new event. It's just something that's happening to change stuff you know, to change our current way of being. Uh, the world is not completely going to be destroyed or anything. It's just life as we know it. Life as we have grown accustomed to and comfortable living in will change drastically. But we'll talk about that towards the end as well. Now, I want to talk about the whales, the space whales. There is something about that concept that is stuck within the conscious minds or the subconscious minds of the collective of humanity for quite some time. And I believe that there is a really great reason why we have all of these monster movies, you know, in the past, I don't know, 60 years or so, but really amplified in the last decade. Um, of these huge, giant beings, you know, in all their various forms. Sometimes they kind of look like us, like the Titans. Sometimes they look like Godzilla over here. Sometimes they look like Mothra. Sometimes they really actually are giant insects, which is really interesting as well. We'll talk about that. Um, but the concept that they are whales, space whales, or by extension, space monsters, right? Huge, gigantic, uh, otherworldly beings that have left their fractal reality, right? Where things are considered normal to them and they have fallen down into the microcosm. They have entered into uh, another cosmic world, basically, which is our world, you know? And we can do that, that, that as well. It can work in reverse. And I'll talk about that as well and why I think NASA hides things and this other space agencies, but we'll talk about that later. So anyhow, these are the whales. Now, one of the signs of the end, I did a video on it, is the strange sounds that are heard in the skies. You know, that's one of the sounds, uh, the signs of the end times. One of the signs of the changing world as we know it, the change of the paradigm, uh, our reality as we're accustomed to seeing it, right? The sign is that you would hear the trumpets, the trumpets of God, the blasts, the horns, you know, um, various cultures, various religions, they all described it differently. But one could make the case that those sounds coming up from the sky, which I've already done a video about, basically it's just the ice dome that's above us, and by the way, you don't have to share in my cosmology or my perspective in order to appreciate these things. Um, what I'm going to be sharing with you all works with various models and various cosmologies and things like that. So just keep an open mind if you'd like to. So with that being said, the monster songs or the whale songs that are being heard in the skies above us, that long, drawn out, booming, trumpety uh, it sounds almost kind of like a whale, actually, if you think about it, like huge, giant whales up in the sky. Um, I love talking about this. I do. I love talking about all of these things. Um, I love talking about what others consider to be just ridiculous. Because one, not a lot of people argue with you because they don't even know where to start. It's like, you know, you're basically with subjects like this, I figure you either it resonates or it's 
absolutely alien. You know what I mean? So I'm not worried about too much negativity with, you know, or reactions with the video. I'm actually really excited about it because I believe I have this feeling that it's going to resonate with a lot of you out there. So we're going to tie all this in together. Uh, basically the sound of the ice dome thinning out and starting to crack is what people are hearing around the world. The strange sounds in the sky that nobody can really pinpoint. They just know it's coming from above, just like the monsters that are coming from above. Now, really interesting in the new Godzilla movie. And this same theme is seen throughout, uh, pop culture and various other, uh, works of fiction and, fantasy and things like that. You typically have the monsters on the other side of an ice wall or sometimes frozen within the ice themselves. And, you know, once they're thawed out or whatever, then the monsters come back and typically they're very large beings, you know, but the ice is what typically kills them or at least temporarily stops them. You know, it, it's, it acts as a barrier to keep them away and to keep us safe. So yeah, I believe those are the whale sounds that we've been hearing or the monster sounds that we've been hearing that have been coming from the skies. So whenever people talk about space whales, yes, some people, most people probably, um, just think that it's a fanciful, fun idea, like, you know, the, the cosmic cats in space t-shirts and stuff like that. However, these things are based on reality. Um, at least for me, the monsters and the whales, this is all based on reality. Now, a lot of this is going to start making sense as well when you think about the breadcrumbs that have been passed down to us from movies to movies and TV shows to TV shows. Um, I would like to mention the fractal verse, okay? Oh, by the way, the caterpillar, that's basically... In my mind, okay, think about this because we're going to talk about the fractal verse, all right? Basically, the fractal verse is the microcosm right? When you look into a microscope and you see all that life, just just teeming with life, you know, all over the place, life is everywhere. Um, that's the microcosm, the tiny one. You could think of it like the who's from Dr. Who. They're all super tiny little beings that basically live like on a flower. And that's where you get Horton. Here's a who, right? Horton would be like one of those macrocosm beings or monsters or gods or whatnot. And the who's live inside of that, which is the microcosm. Or you could think of it like uh, the Men in Black lockers. If you remember that from Men in Black Part 2, they, Will Smith opens up one of the lockers and there's all these little tiny beings and they start worshiping Jay. And, and he's like, whoa, no. Um, and then he opens up another one when he thinks he's got a good grasp on everything because he's seen the microcosm. So he thinks he's got the grasp on reality, right? But then his buddy opens up another locker where he looks out and he's the microcosm. We're going to get into that towards the end of the movie. I mean, towards the end of this video as well. But anyhow, the fractal versus basically you've got the microcosm or for example, uh, in the movie Ant-Man, it's referred to as the quantum realm, right? Well, they're specifically allegedly talking about the smaller forms of life, the smaller areas, the quantum areas of life. And people associate that with getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You see, I don't know if you can see the Enterprise on there, but it's like right in front of that eye. It's so tiny. Um, but the fractal verse basically is a combination of the microcosm, which is super tiny, and the macrocosm, which is super big, right? We would like to believe that we're living in the macrocosm because we think that we're so grand and we're just the top of the food chain and everything. However, the fractal verse is a combination of the two. And uh, a fractal, there was one on the screen here a minute ago. A fractal is something that you can zoom in on a, a picture. Typically, it's a picture. You can zoom in on it and it will end up repeating itself. Every part contains the whole, just like in a hologram. I used to collect uh, sports cards when I was younger and some of the cool inserts of the time were holographic cards. They were holograms. And the thing with holograms is you can cut off a tiny portion of the hologram and it contains the coding for the entire hologram. So you can make many, many holograms just by cutting one up. And that's exactly what the fractal verse is. Um, it's the microcosm, the small and the, the macrocosm, the large together intertwined as one. Now we see them differently because of our perspective, because of our experience. Um, However, the fractal verse, which is what I like to call it, are both combined together. Um, 
basically they loop onto one each one another. If you think of like a ribbon, that's sort of in like a, you know, if you take a ribbon and you make it into a circle and you twist it, it's kind of like that. You know, you, the further down you go, you end up, you end up getting bigger again. The, the bigger you go, you end up getting smaller again. As a matter of fact, like I was saying, the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland, that was his whole deal, right? One side will make you get bigger. One side will make you get smaller. Who are you, right? Which is a key part of this entire video, by the way. You see, this video is not about who are they. This video is about who are we or who am I, right? That's the question we should be asking ourselves as we continue to explore. The ancient axiom still holds true to know thyself. And I believe this is taking us one step closer to knowing ourselves. Let's talk about the caterpillar again. The caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland, for me, is basically a tardigrade, okay? He's just a huge blue tardigrade that kind of looks like a caterpillar. Now, it's really interesting because in the new Godzilla movie, well, you know, this... This is not just in the new Godzilla movie, but one of the bad guys is Mothra, who is called one of the titans of old, right? One of the old gods or one of the old ancient giant beings or whatnot. Mothra had to be a caterpillar at some point, right? So this all kind of ties together, or it could if, if you'd like it to. Um, now, along with the fractal verse comes the concept of the homunculi. If you don't know what a uh, homunculi is, it is an old alchemical theory of the nature of reality, specifically the reality of humans, our reality that we experience. You see, what the alchemical wizards and scientists of old used to believe and used to theorize and speculate about and this was, this was an accepted topic, you know? This was something that people used to be able to talk about freely without worrying about ridicule and stuff. This was an idea that was tossed around. And basically that is that they recognize that all of this, the body and all of this, this is all sort of mechanical and that there is a being that is living inside of the brain, sort of like, you know, watching it all happen and maybe, maybe helping out to make certain decisions, just like in so many television shows and movies that have replicated the homunculi concept. Um, most notably, people probably remember Disney's Inside Out, you know, in, or, you know, if you're my age, you remember the TV show Herman's Head, which was classic. I loved it. But there's a lot of these types of things. Um, uh, being John Malkovich, you know, all of these concepts of people inside of people. That's something that was tossed around. That's an idea that, that held true to a lot of people not too long ago. And some people still today. However, academia could not wrap their minds around it because they ran into what they thought was a paradox. And that paradox is, well, let's say that there's a little tiny person in my mind. Well, who's controlling him? He must also have a little tiny microscopic person in his mind. And then who's controlling him? And it goes on and on and on and on, right? It goes on for infinity. Therefore, they, they guessed it just can't exist. I, we can't see how that could possibly exist. Um, they could not resolve the, what they thought was a, you know, a conflict or, a contradiction, basically. However, I believe that it wasn't resolved because they weren't thinking about fractals. They weren't thinking about something inside of something that twists in on itself. It continues, it continues looping over and over and over again, you know? Um, I believe that that's going to help to resolve that particular thought process, you know? But anyhow, that's the uh, homunculi theory. There are beings within beings. Now here's what's really interesting and I'm going to I'm we're going to go to camera 2 in a minute because I want to draw something out for you. That way you can really get, you know, a good a good image for what I'm talking about. But I want you to keep this in mind. In the human brain, there are synapses. Many of you have heard of synapses, and those are basically the um those are the mental circuits of time, I'll say, okay? Uh, those, those are the highways and byways of the brain itself. That's where information passes through at the speed of light. I don't know how fast it goes, but it's super fast, right? And um, inside of the mind, we've got neurons. And you've, basically, you've got neurons that talk to neurons, okay? They pass information back and forth. Now, what happens is this neuron over here will collect, will collect information. 
or chemicals, okay? It will store up chemicals, it will store up information, and then it will transfer them electronically or electromagnetically to another neuron. Now, when it does that, based on the information that that neuron receives, it has what's known as an action potential, which means basically it's time for that neuron to make a decision. The action potential based on the information it received or the data that it received from you know, the, uh, the other neuron, it will have a response that is known as inhibitory or excited right? I believe those are the terms. I could be wrong. But inhibitory basically means it's restricted. An action potential, you know, there is a potential for an action there, right? It's just like when you come to a fork in the road and you're like, hmm, should I go left or should I go right? You know, that is an action potential. Same thing happens on a neuron in the brain. Uh, one neuron says, hey, here's a bunch of information. And then the next neuron, the one that receives it, has an action potential, basically a decision to make, and it will be inhibitory, which means it will decide not to take action, or it will be excitatory, which means, I don't know if that's a word, but it's, you know, it will encourage the action, basically. So that concept alone is literally and actually the angel and the devil on our shoulders, our so-called conscience. Now, let's think about this. Let's Assume for a moment that the fractal verse exists. That means, by extension, all of us are that important. We play that important of a role to the greater picture of things, right? We are constantly giving information by living our own lives as to what the bigger picture is going to be, right? The choose your own adventure, if you will, right? You cast your vote, and uh, that's how you live your life. Basically, you cast your vote and your life is your vote. You know, are you are you going to choose good or are you trying to choose bad, selfish or selfless? But I digress. OK, let's talk about um, let's see. We talked about the who's and all of that. Let's talk about the tardigrade. OK, for me, I just find it to be an interesting coincidence. And I don't believe in coincidences that the tardigrade sounds a lot like the TARDIS. And if you're a Doctor Who fan, like I am, then you know that the TARDIS is that time machine, which by the way, I've, I've talked about um, in my Plasma Apocalypse video, I talk about time machines. I'll probably do another video on that. But the TARDIS is a time machine. And essentially, one could say that it's basically a Faraday cage. And they get into the Faraday cage and they're able to come out of it after an apocalyptic event. And they're in a brand new world in a brand new time. Also, if the TARDIS is anything like the tardigrade, um, for those of you who don't know, the big deal about tardigrades, like the little microscopic ones, is that um, they're basically resilient. They they just can't be killed. You know, they're they're more indestructible than you know the infamous cockroach. They can. This is this is the biggest thing about them. They can survive the vacuum of space. Well, if space is not actually a true vacuum the way that it's been taught to us, a lot of this is starting to make a whole bunch of sense to me, at least. So we've got the tardigrade. Now I'm going to go over to camera two. I need to draw some things out. I'm going to draw a quick, uh, the mechanism for all of this. Okay. The mechanics behind it. Now, before I jump over to camera two, let me go ahead and get camera two up here on the screen. Before we do camera two, I just want to share with you all. Okay. I'm not an artist by, you know, by any means, I'm not a great drawer, but I, I'm not bad. Okay. So I'll give it my best shot. And also if you want more information on this, I will be making more videos, but you can check out the plasma apocalypse video that I did, um, because I go into more detail as to the mechanics of this all. So let me go ahead and jump over to camera two over here. Okay. So what we're going to start off with is we're going to start off with um, our current cosmology and the way that our solar system, specifically Earth, is portrayed to us in relationship to the sun. This will become important in just a few minutes. You'll get a bigger picture. All right, so here's let's draw the sun over here. All right, so just remember, you know, I'm drawing this the way that it's presented to us. I'll show you my alternative here in just a minute. But let's just say that that's the sun, okay? So we've got the sun, and over here, we've got the earth. All right? Now, 
there are different levels to the earth, right? There are different spheres. There's different clothing that the earth wears, basically. You know, every, many people are familiar with some of the spheres, like the, um, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the troposphere, the thermosphere, right? Well, two of the most important spheres of the earth that we're going to be talking about are the magnetosphere and the plasma sphere. So let me go ahead and draw those up here. Now I'm going to draw them the way the academia presents them to us today. I want you to watch as I draw and see if anything stands out to you. Let me go ahead and pick a different color here. Okay, so we've got the sun and we've got the earth. I'll just put an E in there for earth. Now here's the plasma sphere, okay? The plasma basically comes out of the front like that and then you've got it sort of goes off to the sides here now this area right here specifically these areas are the main bulges of the plasma sphere all right, let me jump back on the camera real quick. Let me ask you guys a question, okay? What did I just draw? What does that look like, okay? Now, I know a lot of people are going to have various answers, so I'm just going to tell you what I think it looks like. I think that looks exactly like Spider-Man's logo. And I believe that that's exactly what it is. That's exactly why they choose these things. Not only that, but Spider-Man, this is the magnetosphere, all right? Think of magnets, right? The magnetosphere and magnets, the, the colors associated with them are typically red and blue. Well, doesn't Spider-Man wear red and blue, right? And he also has this emblem right on there. And doesn't he, isn't he like electromagnetically charged because when he senses that, you know, something's wrong, his hairs stand up on end. That's his spidey sense. That's an electromagnetic phenomenon. But anyway, enough about Spider-Man. Let's go back to this. Now, this is the current model that we're shown, okay? These legs are basically plasma or uh, electromagnetic energy that's shooting off as the Earth is allegedly traveling in this direction, okay? You know, it's, it's you know, just, just, we'll just say that that's what it is, okay? Because I, I, I'm not going to go into like all the 3D... 3D-ness of it. So we're just going to go with 2D for right now. That's the current model. I'll check that out. I'm like a blue man group. Okay, so that's the current model. Remember, the plasma sphere, right? You've got the plasma and you've got all these legs of that giant spider, basically. Now, let me go ahead and draw the other model. Now, on an alternative model that I'll go ahead and draw up here, we have, just switching colors out, let's draw out the ground. All right, there's the ground. And then we'll go ahead and draw out the sky. All right, and there's the sky, okay? Uh, think of this as Think of this as like a snow globe. And this is a very, very, very rudimentary drawing, okay? Like I said, the sky, the ceiling that we have is that highest, hardest glass ceiling of our world, which myself and many others believe could possibly be made out of ice. Okay, so this is ice. All right, now, let me go ahead and explain how this works. Remember the electromagnetic dome or the uh, electromagnetic mag magnetic sphere, the magnetosphere, right? Remember that. I'm going to show you something. All right, so before all of this happens, our world is electromagnetically charged, okay? There is current flowing throughout our world. Before this is here, there is a charge that's there. So let's say that there's no power coming to our world right now, okay? The electromagnetic charge, just for argument's sake, is off. The moment we turn on the electromagnetic charge, there is a, an electromagnetic confinement bubble. It's an invisible bubble 
that goes around our world. That's the electromagnetic portions of it, okay? That's the, that's the magnets behind it. Now, plasma is coming down from above. The plasma gets basically turned on, the plasma comes down, and the plasma hits this invisible barrier. So it conforms to it, okay? The plasma continues all the way down, and it basically conforms to that invisible barrier. Well, the plasma is generating water. It's creating water. So what happens to that water up there is it instantly freezes. I don't know if it's instant, but it freezes, okay? So now we have ice. We have a solid structure up here. Meanwhile, you know, the plasma is still cycling down and going around into our world, okay? I mean, not into our world. It's actually going around. It's going around the dome, okay? Because the plasma can't get through the dome. This is an important part of this, okay? The light can get through. So let me go ahead and share that with you. Now, remember, this is the ground. Okay, so this is the ground. The plasma's coming down. Now, the plasma cannot get through, but the light from the plasma can get through. And because the dome itself, the ice dome, acts basically as a convex lens, that light comes in and meets at a focal point right here. Once it hits the focal point, that light is redistributed back down. These are your sun rays. This is the light of the sun, and this focal point right here is what we call the sun. Okay, so basically, that's, that's a rough draft version, okay? I'm just drawing it all from memory. Um, but this is important to know because we need to know how the monsters get into our world. Now, if, if, um, if you have a different cosmology or a different worldview, that's okay. There are ways that, you know, you could apply this to your model, to your views as well. I'm just going to, I'm going to do this from my point of view just for now. Okay. So anyhow, here's what happens. Here's how the monsters get in. First and foremost, the monsters or the space whales, they're out here in space, right? They're out here. They look like cooties. <laughs> They're out there, okay? The monsters are out there. What happens is that when the poles shift, okay, regardless of whatever cosmology you have or what your worldviews are, we know that the poles are shifting. We know that they do shift and have shifted all of the time. That shift is this. It is the cyclical plasma um, cataclysm or apocalypse that happens every so often, you know? Now, when the poles shift, okay, there is a maximum. There is there is a point right between the actual shift where everything becomes neutral. And what that means electromagnetically is that everything shuts off. If you look at our world like a giant, uh, you know, electrical machine or something, that midpoint of the shift is when all the energy is gone. It's in neutral. It's not active. Basically, the electricity has been shut off. Now. A few things happen. Let me go ahead and draw it out. When that electromagnetic field is shut off, right? What happens is that this right here, remember the ice is only there because of that electromagnetic force. When that electromagnetic force shuts off and is taken away, this ice really doesn't have any reason to be there because it's not constantly generating water. So what happens is that the pressure inside of our world builds up and holes start to form in this dome, okay? There are holes, probably a few different holes that will open up in the sky itself. That highest, hardest glass ceiling will be broken one of these days. <clears throat> Anyhow, Excuse me. The electromagnetic force is shut off, right? Now, what happens instantly, we live in a pressurized world, okay? Uh, think of this like the inside of a soda can. It's pressurized. 
And the moment you put a hole into it or you open up the soda can, what happens? All the stuff that's loose up here, it wants to go up. It wants to get out, right? So there's an ejection shooting up from the middle. Everything's going up through the different holes, you know? There, there'll definitely be a hole right in the middle. I don't know about the other places, you know, but uh, the middle, right in the center, right where the North Star would be, um, that's the most likely place where the hole would actually expand. Now, the reason that it does this is our world is kind of like a bubble. Um, it's kind of like a fishbowl or it's kind of like um, a snow globe is actually the best example I can think of. In that, um, you know, we, we have a a glass dome or an ice dome right above us, and then we've got the ground around us. So all of the electromagnetic energy is shut off. Everything that's in here that's loose, or many things I should say, not everything, some things that are loose in here, especially those things that are near, directly under these openings, basically get sucked up and jetted out, okay? Now, after this initial burst, I believe there will be a period where these beings will be able to come in. Or perhaps they just fall right in because who knows how many of them live out there, right? Um, and these could be, you know, your extraterrestrials or your aliens or whatnot. Um, however, there is a point or there could be a point where these beings will be able to enter into our microcosm. They will be macro beings. They will be the phantozoids that make uh, an appearance every once in a while, right? Uh, so these beings would literally fall down from the heavens. They would come down to our world from above, okay? They would enter into our world. Now, Obviously, you know, there's there's probably many different forms. I just used the tardigrade as an example, but as you saw in the video, there's probably all kinds of different uh, microscopic beings out there in the in the macrocosm, right? And they probably look just like the microscopic ones that we see, you know, which kind of look monstrous to us, right? But various ones possibly could fall down out of the sky, come down to where we are, and now... All of a sudden, they went from being a regular whatever they are, you know, they're used to their life, etc., to all of a sudden being Godzilla. They are monsters. They're they're walking around probably disoriented, not knowing what's going on, not knowing where they are. You know, the environment's totally different. I can't imagine that all of those beings, you know, that they would reproduce and live long and prosperous and happy lives, especially with people like us down here, right? Uh, we're we're going to want to take out the monsters as, you know, it, as typically happens. Now, I'm not saying that they're all bad. I'm not saying they're all malicious or anything like that. However, I can see why they would have been painted in that light so many times and so often, right? Um, just want to make sure I, I covered all of that that I kind of wanted to cover. Oh, yeah, that's right. So let's go ahead and take a look. I, I, I put this in the video. But let me go ahead and redraw some things here. Now, remember, I was talking about the synapses in the mind. And please keep in mind, it doesn't have to be this. It doesn't have to be a brain synapse. It doesn't have to be. I, I could be totally off. I could be totally wrong on all these things. Oh, by the way, that picture, I got to take that picture down. But that's the queen's legs, the queen alien's legs in um, uh, the new Independence Day movie that had come out. And that's really interesting. Like you, you see like that spider from, uh, from the mist. I don't know if you saw that, but the spider was not a typical spider. It, it was not an actual spider because it had these pinchers on the ends of all of its feet. Well, if you look at a lot of microscopic bugs, which is kind of what they are like, and believe me, I look at lobsters. I look at crabs. I look at all this stuff in a totally different light than I used to. Uh, for me, those are very much alien kind of entities and basically bugs, um, which is why I don't eat them. But anyhow, I digress. Let me go ahead and draw some stuff back here on camera too. Now, let's go ahead and draw out the synapse, okay? We've got one end here. And we've got its sister world over here, up here. Okay, so 
this area in the middle, this is, this is basically, this is a foot. This is the path that goes to the neuron. Remember the neurons, like the main, it's like the library. Okay. So the neuron is like the library of the mind. For those of you who remember the doctor who episode, um, where they had a planet that was an entire library, right? Um, there's a lot of symbolism that in that particular episode, but that is a neuron. That is the library of the mind. That's what stores and weighs out all the different information and stuff. So this, this, what I'm drawing is where two neurons meet each other. They don't touch. And that area where they're really close, but there's a space between them, that's called a synapse. So basically what this looks like is over here on the axon. I believe it's the axon. There's these dips. And keep in mind, this is just one idea, okay? Uh, the, the microcosm in itself or the macrocosm or the fractal verse does not have to be a synapse, okay? It can, it can be other things, you know, but this to me makes a lot of sense on my path right now. So let me keep drawing. Now, you've got these little indentations here, and what happens is the information goes up into these areas from, from the other neuron here. And if you look at this shape right here, if this is electromagnetically charged, what that means is that each one of these little sections is going to have its own confinement domes. And essentially, its own worlds, right? It's going to have its own worlds. Now, um, these bubbles, we'll just call them bubbles, these little bubble worlds, they fill up because they're growing and everything is getting bigger and bigger and bigger because everything is alive. Everything grows. So those bubbles, they're expanding. Just, I mean, for us, they're, they're going really slow, but um, they're expanding. They're getting bigger. They're growing. They're living. They're alive. And what happens is there's ice. Remember the ice forms. So the ice doesn't expand and you know, all of that, the ice will crack. It has to separate. It has to break in order to expand. And so that's, this is all a part of the growing process. All right. So here's what happens, right? These bubbles fill up with information and basically, or I call it information. Other people would say that it fills up with electromagnetism basically. Um, which is really interesting too, because I would love to get into gravity and versus electromagnetism. And I might do that if I have some time at the end, but these bubbles all pop. And when they pop, when they pop all that information, well, not I'm wrong. Not all of the information, the requested information. Okay. This is a huge part of it. The requested information, the necessary, the needed and vital information leaves in order to go to another place. And that happens in the form of these sort of, uh, cataclysms where things explode out. Okay. They go out, they all leave. So all the information in the form of Electromagnetical, chemical, I don't know, you know, like I don't, I don't know all of the technicalities behind it, okay? I studied this for a few days and I still am grasping certain concepts. So I could be off on a lot of stuff. That's why I'm just throwing that out there. But anyhow, the information goes from each bubble, it gets released and it basically goes up into another world. If you're on the microcosm, you're going up into another place, you're going into another world, you know? Or I should say, not you the information is going up into another world, which, you know, basically that's why the aliens want your brains. Okay. I'll, I'll do a video on that, but that's what's happening. Now this information goes up here where there are these gates. There's gates receiving gates on the other side up here. And sometimes those gates will be open. And sometimes those gates will be closed, right? The closed gates won't allow any of the information to come in. So whatever is out here is going to have to find somewhere else to go to get recycled back into uh, a purpose, basically. But some information will pass through and it will go on to the other neuron where it will help 
to determine what to do in this action potential, right? Like basically which fork in the road are you going to take? So that's a small synopsis of what's going on. Now, remember, you've got all this other stuff out here, microscopic, if you will, organisms. And they may be able to enter into these worlds during this um, expansion, dur during this sort of explosion, if you will. It's not really an explosion, but it's like the bubble bursting, basically. So that's, that's the gist of it, okay? And let me go ahead and erase this real quick. Let me see if I need to draw anything else. Let's see, we talked about the dome, we talked about the plasma sphere. Yeah, well, you know what, I'll just go ahead and leave that up there just for, you know, just for a reference or whatnot. People might want it to be to stay up there. So this is the fractal verse. This is the microcosm meeting the macrocosm. This is a combination of the two. Remember, like I said, the coding for everything, welcome Jenny. <laughs> The coding for everything is inside um, of itself. It's self-replicating. It is, it is holographic. It goes on and on and on. Or at least it seems to go on and on and on. So think of the implications, right? Think of the implications. What are the implications? If we live in a fractal verse instead of a universe, right? Essentially, we live in a multiverse, as it has also been described. And what that means is it brings significant value and importance to your life, to everything that you do, to everything that you are. You are very, very important to the greater, grander, bigger picture. Okay, let me jump off of that particular subject. Let's start talking about monsters, all right? Monsters exist. Isn't this amazing? I love being able to say things like this to other people seriously, right? It's not just something funny to talk about. I'm dead serious when I'm presenting this information. When I'm doing my research and my studies, I'm dead serious. By the way, um, that particular clip down there, that was from um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? And there's the caterpillar. That is, that's a tardigrade. I don't know about you guys, but to me, that's tardigrade. And he's totally painted blue. And not only that, but he's on the mushroom, right? Uh, the Alice in Wonderland's caterpillar is infatuated with mushrooms for some reason. And the concept of growing way large and growing way small, right? The, the macroverse and the microverse. Um, that's the brain bug as well. I'm definitely going to talk about that because we're going to talk about brains and how brains out in space and some really interesting, wacky ideas that I've had. Um... But anyhow, I'm talking about the caterpillar. He loves mushrooms. Why? Not because he's just the laid back guy and he's into psychedelics and stuff. You know, there's a reason behind all of this. The mycelium highway, just like it's described in, um, that's the magic school bus. <laughs> just like it's, uh, just like it's described in the new Star Trek series, the Star Trek discovery, right? The tardigrade is this space whale or this space creature, um, that can like super, super fast travel through space, almost instantaneously through this sort of mushroom highway, right? Through, uh, the mycelium path, basically mycelium is like, uh, the roots of mushrooms. Okay. They, they're everywhere. It's the, the, the largest living organism that we know of in our world is a network of mycelium or mushrooms. Okay. This, they're spores. I think they're spores, but they are mushrooms. So I find it interesting that the tardigrade in Star Trek is able to shoot through space, which is really the quantum realm of the Ant-Man or really the fractal verse of everything it's able to navigate these things very quickly using that sort of mushroom uh highway is how it's referred to in the tv show now just like the synapses and the paths that exist within our minds already and when i talk about the mind i'm not talking about the brain i'm talking about the thing that forms the brain there's always the invisible and the energetic principles and then follows the physical. Okay. So brains come after mind. Mind is first. So anyhow, 
the TARDIS, oh, excuse me, the Tardigrade is able to travel these uh, circuits of time, just like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, right? Uh, and if you look at Doctor Who's wormhole or pretty much any wormhole um, or Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure when they're, you know, going through all the circuits of time and it's basically these crazy wormholes going all over the place super fast and there are these lights shooting all over the place. That is the information superhighway of the mind, of your brain, your physical brain. So what if, you know, you've got some sort of a being out here that has the ability to travel through, you know, certain highways in the mind. And it goes very, very, very quickly in those particular pathways, you know. Could that be the wormholes of our sci-fi and our fantasy? It could be. It very well could be. Now, obviously, one of us, we would need the proper protection, you know. You can't just jump up and get sucked up into the sky with nothing on and you're just, you know, expect to breathe and everything's going to be fine. Probably not, right? I don't think so. Uh, so you would need some sort of protection. Now, it's interesting because in Star Trek Discovery, one of the bad guys actually, he went inside of a space whale in order to survive space. Like, and he was able to move around and stuff like that. And later on, the crew of the Discovery used the tardigrade itself in order to traverse you know, this uh, mycelium highway. But I wonder if that's what that is, you know? I wonder if that's the secret behind the uh, the wormholes that are being used to time travel or to go to other worlds, like Sliders. I don't know how many people are from the 90s, but um, there's a show, really good show, called Sliders, where a portal would open up and these people would shoot through the portal and end up on an alternative Earth. Basically one of these anywhere out there. Each one of these you could call Earth and then give it a number. Okay, that one could be Earth number two, number three, and number four. Okay, they're all Earths. They're all probably going to be very similar on the inside, you know, with differences and whatnot. But essentially, those are those are your planets. That's Those are your other worlds. Those are other places, you know. Uh, where you can seek out and explore strange new worlds and new civilizations. That's Star Trek. And every time I watch Star Trek from now on, I'm definitely going to see this. Uh, let's see. What else was I going to talk about? Oh, that's right. Not only may there be creatures entering into our world whenever the sky opens up, as Chicken Little correctly prophesied, that the sky is falling. The sky indeed is falling and will continue to fall until it's breaking off in huge chunks and everyone will have to recognize it. And that's not to scare people, by the way. I've had some comments where people are accusing me of fear porn or something. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just sharing my experience. I'm actually very excited. I'm not afraid of any of these things. I can't wait until I see them and participate and, you know, experience all this stuff because I'm, I'm excited about it. So it's not to scare people. And if you are scared, you don't have to watch, you know, but anyway, Let's stop talking about the creatures that might come into our world. And let's talk about those beings that are trying to get out of our world, right? This may put a whole new light on our space agencies because this is the window of opportunity that they have to blast off, to leave, to get out, to go where no man has gone before. <laughs> right? And they would need the proper protection. Now, if out there is anything like in here, then it's not just empty space. It's actually very fluid, which now all of a sudden makes sense why these different space agencies would look like they're getting ready to go swimming. They're getting ready to put on scuba diving gear, basically, right? Just like in Fantastic Voyage, just like in all these different movies that depict the same types of things. Oh, Meet Dave. That's another one. I bet somebody said it in the comments, but, uh, yeah, Eddie Murphy, meet Dave. There's all the little homunculi in Dave's body or whatever, and they control his actions. So maybe that's exactly why NASA has been keeping these types of things a secret from people, right? Um, now I'm going to get it. I'm going to get more into this particular part of the theory in future videos, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Now, some of you might be asking, why do I keep showing images saying he is the one and there's Jet Li's the one, etc.? If the concept of the fractal verse 
holds true. Well, that means there can only be one. You know, the concept of oneness, man, it really hits home when you look at things from a fractal perspective, right? There can only be one. Just And that's basically a quote from Highlander, okay? There can only be one. You know, there's no division. There's no separation. We're all one. We all have the coding for one another within each other because we're holograms or we are a hologram, I should say. It's the holographic universe, one could say, which is also the law of mind. It's called the law of mind. <clears throat> Basically, mind is all that exists. But yeah, that gets really, really deep. All I wanted to do is I wanted to share this information about uh, the monsters. Oh, and that's, by the way, I also talk about the moon breaking apart. I should probably mention that, okay? So, let me go back up to camera two. All right. Let's redraw. Okay, now, when we look up at the sky, we see what we believe is the moon, okay? And the moon has all of these puck marks all over it. Okay? But what you're really looking at, possibly, is the roof, the ceiling, the ice dome of our sister world. That world that happens to be directly across from us on the receiving end of wherever we are, right? And all of those crater marks are not crater marks at all. They're explosion marks. They're, they're marks where their dome has fallen apart, right? Typically, like I said, each time in the middle, but it's also growing. It expands every time. Every time it renews itself, every time there's one of these cataclysms, um, that electromagnetic field gets bigger because it's growing. So this accounts for why our years are getting longer and longer, right? Uh, my research has shown that, you know, during the times of Enoch, the, the year was 360 days. It wasn't 365. Now, you know, I, I don't want to argue semantics, but the point is, and that's me, that's me with the tardigrade. I found that on uh, Snapchat. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I was researching tardigrades, and next thing I know, tardigrades are on Snapchat. Why would they put that in there? You know what I mean? Oh, because it's cute and whatever. Nothing is done by happenstance. Nothing is done by chance. Everything is done purposefully. Uh, very purposefully. Anyhow, I digress. You look up there, you're basically seeing the markings of cataclysms past for another world. Our sister world is what I like to call it. So, for example, this is where one of the holes once was, where their plasma entered into their world, okay? And then it shifted as it grew. So it's growing, Okay, so it's getting bigger and bigger, which means that our years are getting longer and longer. Now, one of the other signs that this apocalypse is about to happen to us is that the days get shorter and shorter, right? The days are getting shorter and shorter. Well, why is that happening? That's because that plasma that's spiraling down, remember, the light enters into our world, okay? And it follows suit. It spirals around. Um, what happens is, it speeds up. It goes faster. So our days get a little bit shorter and a little bit shorter. Many of you have probably said to yourself, this year, last year, the year before, probably for the past five years, you probably said, wow, that year went by really fast. Does it feel like that year went by really fast? That's because it did go by really fast, okay? You're not imagining things. Don't feel like you're crazy. Don't feel like, you know, Maybe you're just, maybe this is just what happens when you get old, you know? Maybe it just feels like time is speeding up. No, be rest assured, your gut feeling, your intuition is correct. Time is speeding up. And it will continue to speed up until it gets to that point where there is the changeover of the poles. The poles shift, there's a neutral point where basically the lights turn off and everything. But let me get back to the moon. I'm sorry, I digress. So when you look up at the moon, you will see the moon break up. I don't know what it's going to look like, but, you know, let's just say it breaks up into pieces. And this is also portrayed in many movies that the moon breaks, including 
the Umbrella Academy. Okay. Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't care about spoilers and all that stuff. That's, that's, it's so insignificant in comparison to the things that we're talking about. But yeah, in the Umbrella Academy and so many other areas, it shows the moon breaking apart. Okay, that's another sign. If you see the moon breaking apart, that means they're going through the cataclysm. Cataclysm. They're going through their own apocalypse, and you're watching it. That's why the moon is going to break apart. Um, and they very well might have tardigrades and sandworms and, you know, all kinds of weird uh, phantasoids entering into their world. And like I said, I call them phantasoids because they don't survive here for very long. You know, I can't imagine that they would, they would, this isn't their, their like normal environment. Okay. Um, so yeah, that makes sense why we don't see them walking around all over the place. Right. So when this happens, it's also going to be happening on our sister world over there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. All right, now I've got a lot of other stuff, uh, topics that are directly related. This particular video is a part of my Plasma Apocalypse series. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put all my Plasma, uh, uh, plasma Apocalypse videos into one playlist. That way they can all be kind of together. But this part is going to be about the monsters, those beasts of old, the Leviathan returning, uh, the behemoth returning, the ancient monsters, giant monsters of Ragnarok coming back to fight in the final battle or whatnot, right? Um, these are echoes of reality. These are things that are not science fiction. They're not lies. They're not made up. They're not fanciful, you know, something that somebody just created out of thin air as it has been written. There's nothing new under the sun. These things come from somewhere. It is an imprint that has been left upon the collective subconscious of our minds. And guess what? The closer we get to that particular time happening, I think I'm done drawing for now. The closer we get to that particular time happening, the more I believe we're all going to start remembering these things, which I'll share with you in another video. I find, I'll share with you why I find that to be ironic, right? Right before these things happen, we start remembering all the old ways. Like we don't even know where the information comes from. We just start recollecting. We start remembering. We start feeling it, you know? So that's why I said I wanted to do this video. I believe a lot of you will feel what I'm conveying, you know, it might not be coming out of my mouth perfectly. It might not make, um, you know, mathematical sense, or you know, it might not add up to what academia has shown us. See that that's the spider I was telling you about with the pinchers. That's not a spider. Okay. That's a phantasoid. That's, that's something that should be this small in our world, but it's grown to immense size, which that could also be another one of them. <clears throat> and, uh, Oh, the thing down there, I'll show it to you guys. This thing down here, by the way, if you're wondering, it's like a Kraken or something that's holding on to, you know, the whale or the whale monster. Um, in ancient mythology, there was a war between the Titans and the gods. And it was called, um, it was the, called the Titanomachy. And uh, Titan just means gi giant, right? And Maki means war, right? Or fighting. So the war of the giants, basically. And it has been said that during the war of the giants or the war between the Titans and gods, that monsters of old were unleashed in order to help the gods to defeat the Titans of old. Um, some of those monsters very well could be the phantasoids, the actual creatures that fall down into our world. And now, you know, they become a part of our story or, and I should say, and they're also the Hecatenares, which is the 100 armed monster and the cycle ops, which I talk about in my other videos as well. This is all describing the plasma apocalypse. Excuse me, Godzilla, but I'm trying to talk. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyhow, I think that's all I had. Let me just double check. I want to make sure I cover as much as I possibly can in this particular one. We talked about the magic school bus symbolism, fantastic voyage, Star Trek, the uh, Star Trek, the tardigrade. Oh, this also gives credence to the whole concept of the insectoid alien race, right? That's also a staple in our collective subconscious. You know, a lot of people, 
believe those people who are very into the alien community, they know that there are insectoid aliens. Well, wouldn't you say that these phantozoids look like gigantic insects? And, uh, you know, maybe that's why gigantic insects make their ways into our movies and our pop culture and things of that nature. They kind of look like gigantic bugs, right? And maybe some of the life that we do have here is what's left over from those giant beings, right? Uh, let me give you an example. Um, I think it was, I want to say it was Godzilla. I can't remember now. Oh man, I totally forgot. But anyhow, um, you know, in some of these, in some of these movies like Godzilla, like the, the monsters will live at the bottom of the ocean or their eggs, their babies will live at the bottom of the ocean. Right. And so the babies hatch or whatever, and they stay down there for a while. And by the way, some of these ocean creatures like squids and things like that, they can live for a very, very long time. Um, and these creatures might also be able to live for a very, very long time. They very well might be able to outlive humans easily once they enter into our realm. And they are not easily destroyed, just as we know about the tardigrade. The tardigrade can survive like super heat, superheated temperatures. It can survive super cold. It can survive the vacuum of space, all of that. Um, it's basically kind of indestructible. So can you imagine when the biblical authors were writing about the Leviathan and the behemoth? And they're basically saying like, are you able to challenge these beasts, you know, like that are so much bigger than you? You're, you're tiny in comparison, you know? Um, but yeah, so man, I don't want to, I don't want to stop talking about this subject. Cause this is like, this is one of my new favorite subjects to talk about. Um, Oh, the fog monsters. I almost forgot. Man, okay, well, that's what we'll talk about last. We're going to talk about the fog monsters. All right, so as you can see down here, that, that, was, for, that was a clip from the movie uh, The Mist. Yeah, it's called The Mist. And there's a lot of movies just like this, okay? In the movies, and oftentimes in television and whatnot, when these old world monsters, when these fantastic beasts of old are portrayed, a lot of times... They're sort of in the fog, like people can't really make them out or whatnot. Not always, but m much of the time, I call them the fog monsters. And I believe that the reason why they're in the fog is because two possibilities, okay? Number one possibility, when the plasma enters into our world, because their holes will open up from the sky, which protect us from the plasma, um, a lot of our world will burn, okay? Whatever that plasma touches, those the main giant uh, fingers of plasma, uh, whatever the main fingers touch, like the like if the plasma is a tree, the main finger would be the trunk, okay? So whatever the, the trunk of the plasma touches uh, basically will destroy whatever it touches, um, possibly petrifying some things, definitely turning a lot of things into fire and just melting some stuff. That's not going to happen everywhere, so I don't want everyone to think that there's no, there's no hope, okay? There is a hope. There's a new hope, so to speak. Um, but basically, whatever these plasma fingers touch will be burned up. It will be destroyed. And, um, man, I totally forgot where I was going with that. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, yeah, the fog. That's right. So it could be when the pressure is released from our world. Remember like the soda can, right? We do live in a pressurized system, right? Regardless of whatever our world views are, we know that we have pressure systems in our world. The weatherman tells us so. Our world is pressurized. Well, if we do have a highest, hardest glass ceiling, or as I call it, an ice dome, many other people do as well, when it's punctured, right? And that Everything gets sucked up through those holes for a time. Uh, that means that the pressure gradient will be different. The pressure will change, which possibly could boil the oceans or many bodies of water, different bodies of water. They could boil, okay, because water boils at different pressures, okay? It's very easier, easy to boil water at room temperature with the right pressure. So that's one possibility as to where all this fog and mist comes from. A lot of it could be in our world at that particular time until it, you know, returns to normal. The other thing is just the fires. 
And I think that was actually the first point I was going to make. The fires themselves will create a lot of smoke. So we will have a sort of, many of us, depending on what your location is, you might be in a location that experiences just the mist. You might be in the mist movie one of these days, believe it or not. You could definitely be in the movie, the mist, okay? Like all of, I'm so excited about all of this because this means... Life is going to get interesting, okay? This is why we go to the movies. This is why we read books. But just like the librarian in The NeverEnding Story says, your books are safe until you jump into one. That's when it's a real story, right? Because lives are on the line. You, you're a part of it. You're actually excited. Like life has purpose all of a sudden. So I'm excited about those things. So anyhow, uh, let me just go ahead and try to recap. We've got... Um, you know, the plasma catastrophe, we've got the moon blowing up or exploding or whatnot, which it will do. And, uh, we've got the holes in our skies opening, opening up, uh, creating a huge difference in pressure. Um, more so the closer you are underneath the hole that opens up, right. Or like it's been portrayed, you know, like, um, like a portal will open up in the sky and the aliens will come down. It's, it's the same story being told over and over and over again. You know, the aliens are going to shoot their blue beams and people are going to get sucked up into the tractor beam. Or, you know, if you're a religious person, person, this could be the return of your God and people will float up into the, into the sky to be with, uh, to be with their Lord. It's, it's the same story. It is a never ending story. It's the same story told over and over and over again. Now, there's a lot of good news that comes with this. Let me, th- let me just, I don't want to wrap things up on like a, an apocalyptic scary note. So I'll throw out some good news. And then I have a lot of, a lot, lot more stuff to share with you all as I make more videos about the subject. But one of the good news is it very well may be that when this all happens, stuff is going to change with us. Some of us, some of us, I believe are going to change in very different ways uh, depending on what your charge is, depending on what your vibe or your vibrations or your frequency is. Okay. I believe that there are going to be a lot of really interesting changes. One of those changes that I believe you can all look forward to, or I'm sorry, many of you can look forward to is telepathy returning the ability to talk to animals, to Godzilla, to dragons, to whatever people would like to call them, okay? Your ability to actually communicate without using the spoken language, without using the symbols in guttural talking, you know what I mean? So you'll be able to become telepathic once again, and that's just one of the interesting powers that will be manifest, I believe, during these times, and especially after these times. Um, But a lot of magical things are going to be happening When all of this, when all of this happens, like I said, and I've been saying this for a while, you know, it is the law of cycles. That pendulum will sway one way and it'll sway right back just as hard the other way. We know we came from paradise. We know we came from utopia. We know we came from a, a great place. That's where we started. And then things got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. We know the world, well, I know the world, was once very magical. Just like uh, the Jedi, you know, just like any of these movies where people have superhuman abilities, superhuman powers, uh, paranormal powers, if you want to say. That's where we started. And that's where we're going to start again. That's where we will return to one of these days. So it's not something uh, to fear. It's not something to be afraid of. The purpose for me sharing this is to share the information, you know, the more that we anticipate something, the less afraid of it or shocked by it we are when it makes an appearance, right? So if you knew Godzilla was real, you knew Godzilla was out there wandering around, you know, and, you know, we keep track of him everywhere or whatever. If Godzilla was a commonality in our world, if he was the norm, would you be afraid of Godzilla as much as if he just popped out of nowhere and you thought it was all bogus? You thought it was all a hoax? You thought it was all fantasy and fiction and sci-fi? And all of a sudden that walks into your city, disoriented, not knowing what's going on, knocking things over, you know, hungry. I don't know. I don't know. I think you'll be a lot less fearful when things like that happen. Um, and I'm not saying that that's exactly what's going to happen. All of these events are all going to be retold fractionally, just like how we are, uh, fractals, 
We live in a fractal verse. So our stories that we tell, they, they have all of it in little pieces. These are the breadcrumbs that I always talk about. These are the breadcrumbs that are handed down to us. So every culture in different times, all the different people in the different places, they're all going to tell these stories from different angles, from different perspectives. They're going to have different names. They might call these whales, monsters, great beasts, fantastic beasts, you know, as that's popular today. And that's exactly what that's from, by the way. You see, the closer we get to the end, the more you will see the truth revealed in the fantasy because the creative mind is going to be so much more in touch because the energies are shifting. The poles are shifting, right? Which means the the polarity itself is going to shift. The paradigms will all shift. It will go from uh, patriarchy to neutral to matriarchy or uh, God being a he and a him to neutral, to God being a she and her, and this and that. It's, it's just cyclical. Same thing told over and over and over. And it's a beautiful, wonderful, and amazing story. I know a lot of you are probably dying to know more about my thoughts on NASA, but I don't want to share too much more right now because I know this is probably the first time many of you have heard some of these ideas. And I want, I want this information to just marinate in your head. I want you to be able to just maybe come up with Come up with some of your own ideas and, you know, let some of this stuff speak to you Um, and, you know, open yourself up to the the energies that are coming in. If, if you're that type of a person, if you're not totally fine, whatever, I believe these things all happen anyway. Like this can't be ignored. This is something that is going to happen. Now, I'm telling it from my fraction, from my perspective, from my vantage point. This is my story and I'm sharing it with all of you. Okay. My story is not the absolute story, but in a way it kind of is because all of our stories are fractal. They're all apart. They're all the bigger picture in a little tiny breadcrumb. Okay. So that's what I hope you all get out of this. I'm sure I've missed a few things as I've been talking about this. So Keep your eyes out for future videos. I'm really excited to talk about a lot of different ideas, um, a lot of different theories. And um, I will talk about NASA and what they're out there doing as well. I look forward to hearing all of your information. Before we go, I want to ask you all. Oh, did you see that? That was Doctor Who. Um, In that episode of Doctor Who, the moon cracked open like an egg and this monster came out of it. I think it's really interesting. Fog monsters, all that. I would love for all of you to please utilize the comments section to add to this discussion, add your ideas, add your brainstorming, add your connections to it. You know, I I really, I don't, I'm not, I like it when people use the comment section to be like, Hey, you know, great video or, or that's awesome. You know, compliments, stuff like that. That's nice. But it's so much more valuable when people are adding to like, Hey, what about this movie and and dropping leads and stuff? Because other people, aside from myself, other people, thousands of people, hopefully, if not more, uh, will come across this video and your information that you're able to add to the story. So if you have, um, I'm interested in hearing, you know, your movie connections because I like the movie world. Um, but if you have television shows, books, uh, news articles, current events, whatever it may be, I want to encourage everyone to start leaving those little breadcrumbs as little signposts, you know, on my videos, on the videos that talk about the plasma apocalypse or the plasma cataclysm, whatever you like to call it, the MCO, some people call it, uh, there's different words for it. If you have information to add, please share the information, leave a comment, leave a link, leave a, an article that we can check out that we can read. You know, we don't have to give other people the answers. Just like I don't give people answers. I just share my experience. I share my walk. I share my path. You know, I would love to learn and glean and get some value from the path you have walked as well. So I just want to encourage you all to do that. Let me check my notes one last time. Let's see. Phantasoids. Monsters, whales, leviathans. Oh, the sounds coming from the sky. We talked about that, right? Those are sort of those whale sounds. Um, Let's see. Trapped behind the ice. I know in Game of Thrones, 
There's the ice wall, which holds back all the magic, basically. I haven't really even watched that show, so I could be wrong, but that's what I've heard. Like that ice wall holds back all the magic and the magical creatures and stuff like that. Giants, I guess. Um, we've got the Decepticons leader. I totally forgot his name, but in Transformers, the bad guy, he was frozen into ice, you know, and, and he was thawed out. Um, in the comic books, if you're a comic book fan, I will be talking about this particular comic book um, bad guy. Okay, I just call him bad guys. Um, Starro. And I, I mentioned him before. I'm going to be doing a whole video all about Starro, all about um, the Kraken, all about Cthulhu, all about the Dream Crabs, all about the Face Huggers. You know, it's all very much interrelated. And I believe that many of you are going to start to put together so many more puzzle pieces. And I'm so excited to hear about all of, you know, what you thought about all this information and your breadcrumbs that you have to share with, with myself and other people. Oh, uh, let's see here. Is that it? Just want to make sure I haven't missed anything. I'm not going to go back and edit this video or anything. Um, you know, I don't know. That's it. That's pretty much it. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to go. I'm Jay Dreamers. I'm going to be doing more videos like this. Highly recommend checking out, uh, doing a Google search for plasma catastrophe, plasma apocalypse. I've done my own video on it. I highly recommend checking out the video I did called the plasma apocalypse. If you haven't, I go into more detail about the plasma side of things. Okay. About the actual events and you know what you can expect as far as what's happening in the skies and all that. I'm going to, I'm going to make more videos about that. But right now, I just wanted to share with you my monster world. I like to be able to tell my son with all honesty, monsters do exist. And then I teach him why not to be afraid of them. So uh, yeah, vampires, monsters, werewolves, pretty much everything that we ever thought was fiction and fantasy in our world and not real might be more real than the world that we have experienced, than the world as it's been presented to us, to quote The Truman Show. Uh, let's see. All right, with that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and go. Hang out, watch the credits, uh, check out all the people who make my videos possible. I really appreciate all of you. And I want to say thank you and welcome to all of the new members. My channel has really had a lot of new members in the last couple of weeks join, and I'm honored. I'm honored to continue just doing what I do. And it's really nice. I'm glad that I'm glad that so many of you appreciate my work. Uh, so good vibes, goodbye, and I'll see you next time.